Bonjour and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective. And today we're looking at chapters 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 of The Da Vinci Code. So where we left off, they finally went to the Mona Lisa. She got a blacklight pen. They waved it eventually over the Mona Lisa and there's six words written on the plexiglass. And we just got the backstory on Mona Lisa. Apparently she's an androgynous figure because Da Vinci was a homo. Apparently that's important to know. I don't know. Um, And meanwhile, Silas is still in the church. (laughs) Still in that fucking church. But Sister Sandrine, she's onto him. Oh, and Fash is also onto Sophie helping out Langdon escape. It's all happening. And yet there's still so many flashbacks that it's really slowing down the momentum of the plot. But let's get into it. So for chapter 27, we pick up with Lieutenant Colette, who's still seated at Sonia's desk, like in the Grand Gallery. I thought the whole Louvre was like abandoned, but he's still there on watch. So that's good. And so Fash is telling Lieutenant Colette about the bar of soap. And he's like, what? But how could Langdon have known about the GPS dot? And Fash says it was Sophie Nouveau. She told him and he goes, what? Why? And Fash says, damned good question but I just heard a recording that confirms she tipped him off. And Colette was speechless. He's like, what was Nouveau thinking? That's crazy. She'd interfered with a DCPJ sting operation. She's not only gonna get fired, she's going to jail. And so Colette, he's, okay, I thought he was smart earlier, but now I'm thinking he's a bit of a dum-dum because he's like, but Captain, then where's Langdon? And he's sort of like, um, okay, you're the one in the Louvre, you tell me. He says, have any fire alarms gone off? And he goes, no. He says, well, has anyone come out from under the Grand Gallery gate? And he goes, no. We've got a Louvre security officer on the gate, just as you requested. And so Fash is like, okay then, so we must still be in the Grand Gallery, like catch up. And Colette says, inside, but what is he doing? And I'm like, can you not just go and check? You're right there. You're just on the other side of the gate that is half open. So maybe go and check. And Fash says, is the Louvre security guard armed? And Colette says, yes, sir. He's a senior warden. So he's an old bastard. And Fash says, send him in. I can't get my men back to the perimeter for a few minutes. And I don't want Langdon breaking for an exit. And you'd better tell the guard, Agent Naveau is probably in there with him. Okay, why are we sending the old museum warden in when Colette is right there? Colette's right there. And Colette's like, okay, well, I thought Nouveau left. And Fash says, did you see her leave? And he goes, well, no, but, and he goes, well, nobody else saw her leave. They only saw her go in. So I think she's still in the building. And so then Fash is like, I want Langdon and Nouveau at gunpoint by the time I get back. And okay, so Colette just continues to sit at the desk, not doing anything. That's, uh, that's bonkers. So as the truck's driving off, That poor delivery truck driver is just like, oh, I did not have time for this. I was trying to meet a deadline and here I am getting stopped by the DCPJ for a bar of soap. No one at the delivery site's gonna believe me. They're gonna think I fell asleep at the wheel or I stopped and had a coffee and a nap. Oh, this is, this is disaster for that truck driver, poor bastard. So then Fash, he decides not to take any chances with them. And so hedging his bets, he ordered half his men back to the Louvre and the other half was sent to guard the only location in Paris where Robert Langdon could find safe harbor, presumably the embassy. Like he has not gone anywhere, hurry up. And so we start chapter 28. We are back with Robert Langford, as he was called last week, and Sophie, they're looking at the Mona Lisa and the six words. And Langdon says, the Priory, this proves your grandfather was a member. And Sophie's like, what? You, wait, you understand these six words? And Langdon says, it's flawless. It's a proclamation of one of the Priory's most fundamental philosophies. Okay. So he's written so dark, the con of man. And Langdon's translating that to be about some sort of religious philosophical concept because he still thinks that Sun Ye in the last 15 minutes of his life just really wanted to hammer the point home about the sacred feminine. He doesn't want to point towards his murderer or reveal Sophie's family secrets. He just wants to make a point about the church, apparently, according to Robert Langford. And like, okay, if you're not thinking that it's an anagram, you're a fucking idiot, Robert. But Robert, he goes, Sophie, 
The Priory's tradition of perpetuating goddess worship is based on a belief that powerful men in the early Christian church conned the world by propagating lies that devalued the female and tipped the scales in favour of the masculine, and then they went on to have a secret society of only men. Yeah, add that one up, I don't know. And Sophie, she remains silent staring at the word, so she's probably blocking him out thinking it's an anagram dipshit, can we just not like focus on the anagram of it all? But Langford, he keeps going on. He says, the Priory believes that Constantine, Con, and his male successors, Man, successfully converted the world from matriarchal paganism to patriarchal Christianity by waging a campaign of propaganda that demonized the sacred feminine, obliterating the goddess from modern religion forever. Okay, words. God, has he ever thought about dialing it back a little with the matriarchal, the patriarchal, the propaganda? obliterating the goddess and the sacred feminine. Can you not just dial it down a notch, Robert? Jeez Louise. And Sophie, she's not fucking buying it. She goes, my grandfather sent me to this spot to find this. He must be trying to tell me more than that. And Langdon's like, oh, the poor dear. She thinks it's another code. What an idiot. And Langdon thinks whether a hidden meaning existed here or not, he could not immediately say. His mind was still grappling with the bold clarity of Sonia's outward message. Okay, didn't Sonia write a book on this? So why would he be writing that on the Mona Lisa, Robert? And then he's got to go on about the bloody church being sexist. Which, yeah, it is, but it's just hypocritical for the Priory of Sion to be saying this. That's what, that's what I think. Nobody could deny the enormous good the modern church did in today's troubled world. Well, okay, <laughs> I, I don't know, some people could... I'm not going to get into it, but okay. Yet the church had a deceitful and violent history. Their brutal crusade to re-educate the pagan and feminine worshipping religions spanned three centuries, employing methods as inspired as they were horrific. So then he goes on about the Catholic Inquisition, talking about witches, the dangers of free-thinking women. The church classified all female scholars, priestesses, gypsies, mystics, nature lovers, herb gatherers, and any woman suspiciously attuned to the natural world as witches, midwives were killed because their heretical practice of using medical knowledge to ease the pain of childbirth, a suffering the church claimed was God's rightful punishment for Eve's partaking of the apple, thus giving birth to original sin. Like, a very fucked up stuff. During 300 years of witch hunts, the church burned at the stake an astounding 5 million women. That's a lot. I'd like it to be fact-checked, but let's just take it as truth, since everything in this book is a fact, and we can say, holy shit, that's a lot. And so the propaganda and bloodshed had worked. Today's world was living proof, apparently. Women, once celebrated as an essential half of spiritual enlightenment, had been banished from the temples of the world. There were no female Orthodox rabbis, Catholic priests, nor Islamic clerics. The one, okay, all right, this is where it gets a little bit weird for me. The once hallowed act of hieros gamos, the natural sexual union between man and woman, through which each became spiritually whole, had been recast as a shameful act. Men who had once required sexual union with their female counterparts to commune with God now feared their natural sexual urges as the work of the devil, collaborating with his favorite accomplice, woman. All right, where's, is he projecting? I don't know if that's all a legitimate thing that he's saying here, because as we all know, it's not like sex ever stopped. And then he's talking about how not even the feminine association with the left hand side could escape the church's defamation. And so in France and Italy, the words for left, gauche and sinastra, came to have deeply negative overtones, whereas right hand talks of righteousness, dexterity and correctness. To this day, radical thought was considered left wing, irrational thought was left brain and anything evil, sinister. Again, I think you're projecting. Some people think left wing thought is just perfectly reasonable and right wing thought could be considered the radical side. Dan Brown, he's just like willing to throw anything at the wall just to prove a point that he's made. And all of those examples only prove his point if we accept that left is female, right is male. Like since when? So the male ego had spent two millennia running unchecked by its female counterpart. The Priory of Sion believed that it was this obliteration of the sacred feminine in modern life that had caused what the Hopi Native Americans called All right, okay, so now the Priory of Sion, 
like Da Vinci, Botticelli, Victor Hugo, they're quoting Native Americans. Uh, I, 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 I didn't know if they were aware of Native Americans at the time. But okay. They say Koyanisquatsi. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but that's the concept of life out of balance. An unstable situation marked by testosterone fueled wars, a plethora of misogynistic societies, and a growing disrespect for Mother Earth. Again, even though the Priory of Sion were a famed brotherhood, they're super upset that everyone else is just as sexist as they are. So now that we've got that backstory, Sophie pulls us into the present and she's like, Robert, someone's coming. I can hear footsteps. So Sophie cuts the light and she says, over here. And she like ducks behind a bench or something, but he's too slow. And so someone commands from the doorway, arete, which means, I don't know, freeze or something. And so it's the old security warden that Colette, sent in instead of just Colette coming himself. Uh, beats me. Fash, you're a freaking idiot. As if you wouldn't send your lieutenant in, but you're sending the old museum warden. All right, whatever. So he's like, got a gun on him and he's saying, lie down. So Langdon then has to spread eagle face down onto the famous parquet floor, that floor that he loves so much. And he's like, oh, this is ironic. Oh, this is ironic. I'm in the position of the Vitruvian man. <laughs> Isn't that just a hoot? And that's the end of that chapter. And then we start chapter 29, back at the sans piece. Silas is never going to leave this church. So he's now got a heavy iron votive candle holder from the altar and he's using that as a battering ram against the marble floor. But he doesn't want to make too much noise because he thinks the nun's asleep. He doesn't want to wake up the nun. And so he's like, I need to get a bit of cloth to sort of break the sound. And he doesn't want to use the altar's linen because, you know, he doesn't want to defile the altar. Oh no. He doesn't want to come into the house of God and take cloth off an altar. That's just so disrespectful, even though he's breaking a panel of the marble floor of the church. No, no. Oh gosh. Take a cloth off the altar. Never. So he just takes off his cloak. So now he's naked. I don't know why being naked in a church isn't just as rude as taking a cloth off of the altar, but so that's what he's doing. So he's wrapping his cloak around the battering ram that he's constructed. And he's using that to bash the shit out of the church floor, all while being respectful, of course. So the floor shatters and there's a hollow area beneath the floor, a compartment. And he's like, oh, holy shit, it's really happening. So he finds a thick stone tablet and engraved into the tablet are the words Job 38, 11. So it's a Bible reference. And he thinks a Bible verse? Oh, Silas was stunned with the devilish simplicity. The secret location of that which they sought was revealed in a Bible verse. The brotherhood stopped at nothing to mock the righteous. So he's all like annoyed that the clue that the Brotherhood has hidden is in a Bible verse. He's like, how dare they mock us and defile the Bible? You just broke the floor of a church naked. Why is it okay for you to defile the church, but not anyone else? And Silas doesn't remember the verse, but he's like, all right, well, I should go check it out. And helpfully, there's a Bible on the altar. Who would have thought that there'd be a Bible in the church? He's, he's struck dumb luck. So he goes up towards the Bible. Meanwhile, Sister Sandrine, she's like, oh shit, it's all happening. She was about to flee and carry out her orders, but then she saw him get naked and she was like, oh gosh, oh gosh, his flesh is alabaster white and his back is soaked with blood red slashes. And she's thinking, oh, this ape day. Oh, they're so sneaky and gross. She's like, oh, I don't get it. I don't like it. I don't want anything to do with him. So when Silas starts putting his clothes on and going for the Bible, she's like, shit, better go do my job that I've been tasked to do for the past 50 years. And I've just been delaying for some reason. So she races over to her quarters. She retrieves a sealed envelope that was hidden behind her bed frame. And she opens it and she finds four phone numbers. Paris phone numbers, by the way. So, okay, let's just think this through. So this Priory of Sion, this brotherhood that doesn't have any female members, They've come up with this plan to protect their secret, right? So if any of them are threatened, they'll tell this story leading the killer to the sans piece. And so Sister Sandrine, their little plant, will see that and warn the others that someone's hunting after them, right? Okay. 
but now the unthinkable has happened and all four are dead. But like, okay, so if you're trying to hide this secret, you're going to all these lengths to protect this secret and having these fail saves. Why do all four of them live in Paris? You maybe couldn't have sent one of them to Timbuktu. You couldn't have sent one to live in Wagga Wagga. Just one of them, just send one of them to a different country and make it harder for the person who's killing you all to reach and access you. Silas was able to kill like all four of them in just like the space of 24 hours because they'd made it easy for him. And so she's trying to ring the numbers. I mean, you're you're too fucking late, Sister Sandrine. Downstairs, Silas, he's flipping through the Bible and he gets to the Bible verse. (laughs) And it's such a stitch up. It says, hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. So these Prior of Sion boys, I mean, I hate them and their whole setup, but that's just a great little prank. They've told him this lie. He's gone to the Saint-Sulpice in the middle of the night. Bishop Aaron Garros has been called on a plane and he's calling in favours and Sister Sandrine's getting up in the middle of the night. Everyone's gone all these lengths just for them to be pranked by a Bible verse written on a tablet. (laughs) And the Bible verse is practically saying, Nope, <laughs> no dice, amigo. <laughs> that's, that's clever. I gotta give it to the old PS. All right, so then we go to chapter 30 and we're with the old museum guard. Oh, this poor old man, his name's Claude and he's staring at Langford and he's pissed. He's like, oh, this bastard killed Jacques Sunier. Sunier had been a well-loved father to Claude and his security team. So Claude wanted nothing more than to pull the trigger and bury a bullet in Robert Langford's back. And as senior warden, Claude was one of the few guards who actually carried a loaded weapon. And he was thinking, oh, I can't wait to kill this guy. But then he's got to remind himself being like, no, no, it's a better punishment if he ends up in a French prison. And so Claude whips out his walkie talkie and he's like, I better go and radio over to Lieutenant Colette, who's just sitting at his desk doing nothing. I better tell Colette that I found Langdon. I mean, could you not shout out then if the walkie talkie's not working? Because he's like, oh no, there's no reception. Oh no. And like, just shout out. Colette's down the hallway. It's an abandoned museum. Your voice will carry. But he's thinking, oh, okay, there's no reception on the walkie talkie. I'll just start edging a little bit further backwards towards the doorway. And as he's doing that, he gets distracted by a shadow. And he's like, holy shit, there's someone else in the room. Like, yeah, Nouveau, who you were warned about. And so it's Sophie. She's just not really given a shit. She's just moving in the direction of the other wall. And so Claude, he's like, who's there? Who's there? And so Sophie just goes, oh, it's PTS, which is like their CSI team. And Claude, he's thinking, oh, I thought everyone left. That's weird. And it's like, oh, you're being lied to, Claude. Catch up. And so Claude's like, well, what's your name then? (laughs) Just having a full on chat. And so Sophie goes, it's me. It's Sophie. And then somewhere in the distant recesses of Claude's mind, the name registered. Did Colette not just warn him and say, hey, Sophie Nouveau's probably still in the building. But no, Claude's thinking, oh, that's the name of Sonia's granddaughter. Like what? They, uh, no one told the one security guard that you're sending in that there was an accomplice. I'm sure, I'm sure Colette must have. But Claude's thinking, oh yeah, she used to come here when she was a little kid. Oh, but that was years ago. I haven't seen her in years, not since the orgy. And he goes, it can't possibly be her. Oh, but even if it was her, there would be no reason to trust her because even Claude had heard the rumours of the painful falling out between Sonia and his granddaughter. Oh my God. News spreads in the Louvre. All of the museum staff are just up to date on the status of Sonia and his granddaughter's relationship. I mean, I guess they've got nothing else to talk about. So Claude's still trying his walkie talkie. He's like, oh damn it, I really need to edge closer towards the entrance. It's still 20 yards behind him. So he's still backing it up, pointing his gun at Robert Langford. And he sees Sophie raising her UV light and just looking at this giant painting, the one that's on the wall opposite the Mona Lisa. And he goes, what is she doing? And so across the room, Sophie felt a cold sweat breaking across her forehead. Langdon was spread eagled on the floor and she thinks, hold on, Robert, almost there. Knowing the guard would never actually shoot either of them, Sophie turned her attention back to the matter at hand, scanning the entire area around one masterpiece in particular, another Da Vinci. Okay, why is she so sure and confident 
that this security guard's not going to shoot them. Like, he clearly wants to shoot Robert. Like, he's told us that he wants to shoot Robert. Like, I wouldn't put it past him. So she's scanning this other Da Vinci, but she's not saying anything. And she's like, damn it, there's got to be something. So the masterpiece she's looking at is a bizarre scene Da Vinci had painted, including an awkwardly posed Virgin Mary sitting with the baby Jesus, John the Baptist, and angel Uriel on a perilous outcropping of rocks. And when, oh, oh, flashback time. Oh, flashback time. Okay, so when Sophie was a little girl, no trip to the Mona Lisa had been complete without her grandfather dragging her across the room to see this second painting. Okay, so why do you need the anagrams and the clues if this is just always where you went? You'd just go there anyway to double check, wouldn't you? And so she's like, oh, where is it? Where is the code? There must be a code, a Da Vinci code. But the painting before her had no plexiglass over the top of it. And so she thinks, well, granddad probably wouldn't have written over a masterpiece. Like, yeah, no fucking shit. But maybe he wrote on the back. So apparently the painting's hanging down on some cables or something. So she just like scooches behind the painting. And so now she's scanning the black light over the back of the canvas and there's no purple text. She's like, oh, damn it. I thought he would have really defaced a Da Vinci. Oh, well. But then out of the corner of her eyes, she sees a hint of gold. And so like tucked into like the wooden corner of the frame, there is a shimmering gold chain. It's the key. Okay, it's the key from the flashback from last week. Like, great. It's got the fleur de lis. It's got the initials PS. We now know what that means. She felt the ghost of her grandfather whispering in her ear. When the time comes, the key will be yours. This key opens a box where I keep many secrets. Yeah, okay. We remember. It was literally just four chapters ago. Like, good. Get Get the key. Get the fuck out of there. Like, what are you waiting for? And she thinks, oh, the entire purpose of tonight's word game had been this key. Then why did he have to point them to the Mona Lisa to get the other code to point them to this painting? Like, Jesus fucking Christ. Sonia, you made things too hard, buddy. She says her grandfather had the key when he was killed. Not wanting it to fall into the hands of the police, he hid it behind this painting. Then he devised an ingenious treasure hunt to ensure only Sophie would find it. Like, yeah, we know. (laughs) Okay, thanks for the update on page 159. But yeah, we figured. And the guard's just like, what the fuck's she doing? Why is she dry humping this canvas? And he's still trying to reach people on the walkie talkie, which doesn't work. Okay, this is my other problem with this book. So it's a security guard of the Louvre and his walkie talkie does not work inside the Louvre. In the whole big room where the Mona Lisa is in, apparently because of all the surveillance, all the wires and all the cables in the walls, blots out reception at the Mona Lisa. But is that not where a person who's a security guard would need a walkie-talkie the most? So maybe would you not get your walkie-talkie on a different frequency? I suppose this is the museum where the cameras aren't even operational, so... I guess they're not that concerned about security, but just, you'd think they would be. I mean, they, they did get robbed in 1911, quite recently when the Mona Lisa was stolen. Remember that last week? We heard all about the Mona Lisa being recently stolen in 1911. I mean, you'd think they'd have upped their security since then, but no. So now Sophie's peering around the side of the canvas and she could see the guard still trying desperately to reach someone on the walkie talkie. And his gun is still pointed at Langdon. And she realizes that he can't transmit. She recalls that tourists with cell phones often got frustrated in here when they tried to call home to brag about seeing the Mona Lisa. The extra surveillance wiring in the walls made it virtually impossible to get a carrier unless you stepped out into the hall. (laughs) Okay, yeah, we know, all right. And so then she gets a brainwave about what to do next and she's like, oh, Leonardo da Vinci for the second time tonight was here to help. So she shouts out to get Claude's attention And he looks over and he can see that she's actually lifted the painting off of its cables and propped it on the floor in front of her. What? How did she do that? Are the cables not attached to the canvas? Oh, I don't know. So she's got the canvas. She's just holding this giant canvas. She must be strong because the canvas apparently almost entirely hid her body, but she's holding it up. And she's also shoving her knee through the canvas so that it's bulging. And the guard is like, oh, bitch, what are you doing? He's frozen in horror, watching the priceless Da Vinci stretching. And he's like, holy shit, she's going to push her knee through the Da Vinci. No, that's crazy. Wow. Crazy. You're crazy, girl. That's a $6 million piece of body armor. And he's thinking, I can't put a bullet through a Da Vinci. 
No way, I signed an oath. When I signed on to be a security guard on night shift at the Louvre, well into my 60s, I signed an oath saying that I would never put a bullet through a Da Vinci. No exceptions. And Sophie's clearly bluffing. Like if her granddad was refusing to write on the painting in invisible ink, I doubt she's going to put a knee through it. But she's like, put your gun down and your radio or I'll put my knee through this painting. I think you know how my grandfather would feel about that. And so Claude, he goes, no, that's Madonna of the Rocks. Like, okay, I think she knows what type of painting it is. And he's like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll do whatever you say. Just don't hurt the Madonna of the Rocks. It's a very important painting. And she says, thanks. Now do exactly as I tell you and everything will work out fine. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colette still sitting at his desk, maybe having a yo play or something. Just snacking on a croissant, a ham and cheese croissant, just going la da dee, la da da, wonder when Fash is going to get back. Like, Colette, what the fuck are you doing? Go and scope out the Grand Gallery where your criminal suspect is. Jeez Louise. And then moments later, Langdon's pulse was still thundering as he ran beside Sophie down the emergency stairwell toward the ground level. And Langdon also has the guard's gun now. And he's not feeling too comfortable about it. And taking the stairs two at a time, Langdon wondered if Sophie had any idea how valuable a painting she had almost ruined. Like, yes, I think, I think she did know, considering her granddad was the curator of the Louvre. And also it was part of her plan that it was a priceless artwork that she was threatening to destroy. Like that's how she had leverage to get the guard to let you free. Like, yeah, I think she knew, Robert. God, he's so condescending. I can't with him. But Langdon, he just thinks it's a coincidence. He thinks her choice in art seemed eerily pertinent to tonight's adventure. She'd grabbed a Da Vinci. Like, yeah, uh, because there was a clue pointing her towards the Da Vinci. He hasn't figured that out yet. He still thinks so dark the con of man was about Constantine. He hasn't clocked that it's an anagram yet. He's like, wow, you know what? The Madonna of the Rocks is actually a notorious painting among art historians because of all of its hidden pagan symbolism. And he says to her, you chose a valuable hostage, you know, like, let me give you a little mini lecture while we're fleeing the Louvre. And she goes, yeah, I know, Madonna of the Rocks, but I didn't choose it. My grandfather did, dipshit. He left me a little something behind the painting. And Langdon, he's like, what? What? That's fucking crazy. As if they weren't just on a treasure hunt for like the past hour and a half. He's like, what? But how did you know which painting? Why the Madonna of the Rocks? And she goes, it's an anagram, cunt. She goes, so dark the con of man. She says, I missed the first two anagrams, Robert. I wasn't about to miss the third. And that's the end of the chapter. Big reveal. It was an anagram. Like, oh yeah, brilliant. The last little chapter we're going to be looking at, and we're back at the sans piece. This fucking sans piece. I'm done with it. So Sister Sandrine, she's on the telephone, and she's like, oh my God, pick up, pick up, they're all dead. She'd called the first three numbers, and everyone who answered were like, a detective working at a murder scene, a hysterical widow, a priest consoling a bereaved family. So yeah, all three of them were dead. And so now she's calling the fourth and final number, And she's like, oh shit, oh shit, no one's picking up. He's probably dead, he's probably dead. And then it goes to voicemail. I think out of the past 31 chapters, at least 15 of them have featured voicemails. It's been a very common plot point. So she's leaving a voicemail saying the floor panel has been broken. The other three are dead. And she's thinking about how her whole plan was to call them. If the floor panel had been broken, she had to warn the others. Like, yeah, we know, da 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 The plan was foolproof, unless of course, someone killed all four of them. And then a voice said from the doorway, hang up the phone. And she's like, oh shit. And so she turns in terror and she sees the massive monk. And he's still holding that heavy iron candle stand. And she's like, oh, hey there. Um, uh, you enjoying the sun salt piece? And he says, they're all dead, all four of them. And they played me for a fool. Tell me where the keystone is. And she's like, bitch, I don't know. The secret was guarded by others. And he's like all high and mighty. He goes, you're a sister of the church and yet you serve them. And she's like, okay, mate, you killed people. So she's like, you know what? I'm not going to take that. She's like, no, no, I'm not going to cop that from you. And she says, look, Jesus had but one true message. And I can't see that message in Opus Dei. So she's like, Opus Dei is a piece of shit. And I'm going to say, I'm going to call you out, motherfucker. And so then he's like, what? How dare you 
speak ill of Opus Dei, even though I'm in your church and breaking the church and I'm about to kill you and I'm obviously, you know, sinning all around the place, he erupts with rage. And so he lunges at her, lashing out with the candlestick like a club. And so, I mean, yeah, he's, he's killing her. And her last thought is all four are dead. The precious truth is lost forever. And that's the end of that chapter. Oh, so hopefully he leaves the church now that he's found nothing there and then he's killed Sister Sandrine. I mean, rest in peace, Sister Sandrine, but if it means we get Silas out of that church, out of that location, I'm all for it. No offense, Sister Sandrine. And it looks like we've also left the Louvre. This is like a turning point. It's taken us nine weeks, (laughs) but we finally are leaving our two main locations. So who knows where we're going next? They've got a key. Heaven knows if they know the lock that it enters, but we'll come to that eventually. So I'll see you guys next week. Quick reminder to leave ratings or reviews if you can. You can also go to patreon.com slash breaking down bad books and sign up to be a patron. You get access to all of the bonus content, which is new episodes every week looking at the Maze Runner. And you can also access the previous episodes, which are Divergent, Fifty Shades Darker and 365 Days. So I'll see you guys next week or new locations. Au revoir. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading. 